Uh, tonight I would like to welcome you to the 21st annual Elizabeth Stone Lecture. This year we have the honor of celebrating two special anniversaries here at CUA. 100 years in library education and 30 years as a school. So these are two momentous occasions that we're here to honor and, and recognize today. On July 2nd, 1911, the first library education courses were taught in the very first summer sessions offered here at CUA, 1911. And if you have a chance, in the back we have um, a photographic little um, picture frame of some of the early faculty members, so feel free to take a look at that a little later on. Um, these early classes were taught by librarians from DC Public Libraries as well as the University Libraries, and they consisted of courses uh, like works of reference, systems of classification, cataloging, practical works, and also visits to DC libraries. And over successive summer sessions, uh, between the period of 1920 to 1929, a program was developed so that by 1930, a four-summer training program was designed and offered and a certificate was awarded. The next significant step is that in 1949, the program uh, led to a, a MS and LS was actually uh, Masters of Science and Library Science was offered and that was after we received ALA accreditation and all through the history ALA was encouraging CUA to become accredited and take an active stance in the library world. The 1960s ushered in a new era with Henriette Avram uh, establishing the mark record. We also had Elizabeth Stone joining uh, the staff and Mathilde Rubblestadt, Dr. Rubblestadt, all kind of coming in at a time to add new energy to the program and the school. So tonight we're celebrating the centennial in library education and the 30th anniversary of our school and we are here to acknowledge the faculty, staff, student, deans and all those that have contributed and alumni and all those that have contributed in any way to our school and this noble profession. One other thing I wanted to talk about was looking back at the late 1800s and early 1900s when our program was really starting out. You can see the great thinkers that were of that time. We had Melville Dewey, we had C.A. Cutter, we had Samuel S. Green and Ranganathan. All of those great thought thinkers were putting together the library world and who we are and what we are. And yet if you look at today, while the format may be different, the, the context is the same. Why are libraries important? What is our responsibility to the future? And what impact do libraries have on democracy? These truths, are they self-evident? I now give you Ingrid Shahi. Oh, I'm sorry. Robin Foltz. <laughs> sorry, you don't get Ingrid quite yet, but we're getting there. Just, just give me a little bit of time. Um, so uh, my name is Robin Foltz. I'm the vice president of the alumni board. And as you know, this Stone Lecture was implemented to honor the first dean of our school who you know, brought the program up from just being a department into the school, and that's Elizabeth Stone. Uh, when Elizabeth Stone retired in 1983, Dr. Raymond Von Dran assumed the role of dean. Previously, he'd been assistant dean under Dr. Stone. Uh, he served at CUA until 1987, and then he went on to become the dean of several other prestigious library schools. While, throughout his entire career, while Dr. Van Dran was here and elsewhere, he was noted for his innovation, his collaboration, and his leadership. When he passed away in 2007, we implemented an annual award to honor an outstanding SLIS alumni who embodies the traits that Raymond Van Dran, sorry, I need my notes, <laughs> that, he, uh, that he exemplified. So every year we solicit nominations from the SLIS community and the alumni board you know, debates and chooses the person who best embodies those traits. So this year's recipient, I'm going to pretend like you can't see who it is in your program so we have a big reveal, so just go with it. Um, <laughs> this year's recipient received her MSLS degree in the spring of 2002 from Catholic University. While attending SLIS, she was also the director of the U.S. House of Representatives Libraries and director of the Archive for the House Committee's Records. During her time, she's still a student, 
During her time as the director there, she designed a system to inventory the library, implemented an integrated library system, created a program to preserve and rebind historic volumes, and forged strong collaborations with the Library of Congress and the National Archives. Currently, she is the director of the Executive Office of the President Library, the President's Library, where she leads a staff of 13. Uh, for the past seven years, she's brought change, collaboration, and innovation to the library and the staff. Uh, the nomination that we received was several pages long, so I can't go through all of the things that were in it. Uh, so I just, a few of her many accomplishments are uh, saving over $60,000 by eliminating redundancies in the collection, reconfiguring the physical space to save on storage fees and allow for a larger collection, uh, switching from paper and electronic overdue notices for the EOP, which eliminated 60 to 40 to 60 mail deliveries a week, converting a senior reference library position to an entry-level position to be used for future vacancies. This, in addition to cost savings, allows the library to recruit new graduate students as they begin their library careers. She's worked with the marketing team to develop partnerships with components, resulting in invitations being extended to the library to extend component staff meetings, special trainings, and orientations. They've also created a partnership with the White House Athletic Center to implement a book swap. They've held used book sales with proceeds going to the C uh, CFC, and an ice cream social and training was offered to reach out to staff not located at the main building. Her accomplishments really are best summed up by the nominator, who finished her nomination by saying, she has been a change agent who has implemented innovative ideas into the workforce, led by example, mentored staff and students to strive for the best, has created an atmosphere of collaboration and increased teamwork and productivity within the library. It is with great pleasure that I would like to present the 2011 Raymond Von Dran Award to Lee Yuri. I feel very fortunate that I found Catholic or Catholic found me. Um, it was a mid-year, uh, mid-career change and I have nothing but wonderful things to say about the adjunct professors and the professors that I had here at Catholic. They really prepared me well for the various assignments I've had. So I'm very honored to have been uh, nominated for this award and very pleased um, that the board selected me. So thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Ingrid Xie Yi, and I'm the in interim dean of the School of Library and Information Science. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome all of you uh, yeah, to this particular event. Betty Stone is, um, ha is a great influence, uh, has uh, been a tremendous influence uh, in the history of the school's life, and it is wonderful that everybody now is coming together to celebrate and to honor her. Um, First of all, I want to thank the uh, alumni board for organizing this event and for the staff for taking care of the logistics. And I also want to welcome all of you for making the effort in coming in a rainy night uh, to come together and to talk about the future of the libraries and, and hear Dean Versa, Dr. Rosa's speech. But in addition, I also want to acknowledge a very special group of people. And these are the people who are the soul and heart of our school, and that is our faculty members. And they're really putting a lot of effort in building up our program, and I want to acknowledge them. Several of them are here. I know some of them are teaching tonight, so they cannot join us. But I want to acknowledge, uh, so please stand up. We have uh, Professor Shoemaker, I believe. Yes. And we have uh, Professor John Lasky. Was she? Oh, she was here for a while. She probably had to go to teach. And then we have Dr. Sun and Kim. Uh, Dr. Yang Choi, uh, Dr. Jane Zhang, and Dr. Shun Xin. Thank you, thank you. Um, it really is a, a great pleasure to be here tonight because uh, I always look at the Betty Stone lecture as a way, it's like a family reunion and you have old friends and new friends coming together. And especially tonight, we are welcoming Dr. Versa home. As many of you know, Dr. Versa was the dean of the school from 1994 to 1998. 
And uh, I started under her and learned tremendously from her. She is a great role model and she has many, many wonderful qualities. So if you will indulge me, I'll take a, just a few minutes to tell you about my impression of Dr. Reversa. Dr. Reversa, in my mind, is a great role model because she's knowledgeable. She has a lot of field experience and she also is an experienced educator and quite perceptive about the issues and challenges we face. In addition to the problems we face, she knows the solutions, and that's a good part. She uh, was a tremendous uh, manager of our program when she was here, and I know she continued to be quite successful in a number of schools. Um, one of the things that impressed me most about Dr. Versa is that uh, she truly showed you that she cares. And she also understand that to be a leader, that means that you don't just get that power, but instead you're actually providing service. So being a leader is actually is, is being uh, providing service to your user community, to the staff, to your faculty. Uh, in addition, Dr. Reversa also has the courage and has the insight uh, to be quite decisive. You can also always count on her to do the right thing even though it can be very difficult, but she has the courage to do it and to carry it through. Um, she's quite compassionate and cares deeply about students as well as faculty members. And under her, I really, um, uh, really benefit tremendously that the way she guided me through my tenure process and over these years as a friend and as a mentor. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, in addition, one other quality uh, for those of you who know Dr. Reversa, you should recognize this, and that is she is full of energy. She is like an energizer bunny that just keep on going. Uh, and, and although uh, I know that she's thinking about retiring this year, but you can count on her to be keep on going. She will definitely continue to draw on her expertise and to, to benefit our field. Uh, and so, but before we go on to invite her up here, I do want to share with you some of her really uh, very impressive uh, achievements here. Dr. Rosa currently is the dean, uh, is the director at the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alabama. She has been the director there for eight years. Uh, in her early days, she's actually a Southern Belle. Uh, she's a, 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 an Atlanta native and she attended secondary school in Baltimore, Maryland. And then she received her bachelor's degree in Emory in English, and subsequently a master's degree in, library, in librarianship in Emory as well. She has experience working as a public librarian and uh, also as a librarian in state libraries in Maryland and Pennsylvania. She earned a PhD in information studies at Drexel University. On our arrival, but it's really in a very good school. <laughs> Uh, she concentrates on she concentrated on information systems and management. Dr. Versa also taught in a number of places, and many of them quite prestigious. She was a faculty member at Florida State University, Drexel, and the University of Maryland. Uh, she worked for ISI. This is an institute for scientific information, and that's the publisher of Web of Science and current content. Uh, and she worked there at ISI right before she became our dean. And I can assure you that, that during, the dean, uh, during the time when she was here, she truly brought us up, uh, raised the level of our productivity and the, the excellence of our program, truly put us on the map at that time. Um, Dr. Abusa is a very prolific author. She has co-authored and authored four books and over 70 publications, presentations, and proceedings, and also several book chapters and several research reports. Uh, she was elected president of the, Ameri of the Association for Library and Information Science Education, as well as the chapter chair for the American Society for Information Science and Technology. And she served on the board of a number of professional associations and as a trustee of Iona College. Dr. Versa's success at CUA was a good example of her, of her uh, leadership. And she carried that along to the University of Alabama. And she's do, she did a lot of interesting things that we are doing right now. But so we're following her footstep to excellence. Um, for example, in her school, they have a master's degree program in library information studies, as well as a program in the book arts. And they have, under her leadership, they have enjoyed tremendous uh, growth in their student body. She also successfully helped them launch their synchronous and branded learning in 2005 and 2009. 
And the faculty, again, under her, have become uh, quite successful, and they have received national recognitions for their teaching, service, and research. So definitely, you have set a wonderful model for us, and we really, really feel fortunate to have you here. Now, final thing is that Dr. Rosa is the one of the kind of special people who can do it all. And uh, in addition to her success in her career, she also has a very happy family, as she wanted to share. And I thought this is good to know, is that Dr. Reversa is married to Rocco Reversa the third, and they have a daughter and a, and a son, and also two grandchildren. So you know, she uh, has an amazing career and continue to be uh, putting her energy into helping the field. So without further ado, let's uh, welcome Dr. Reversa to the podium. Thank you so much, Ingrid. That was too nice, and you've revealed about half of what I'm planning to say. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, we will, um, we will, I hope, have an enjoyable evening here. Uh, I thank you so very much, all of you, for the opportunity to speak with you here tonight. It is an incredible honor for me to have been invited. And I'm hoping here that Dr. Elizabeth Stone would approve of this. Uh, it's not the same as it used to be for me when I was here because Dr. Stone always sat on the front row of, uh, the, at the Elizabeth Stone lecture. But I was thinking about it and I decided that she's somewhere aware of this event and probably watching us from afar in a beautifully tailored silk shirtwaist dress and incredibly high heels. <laughs> I had the privilege myself of inviting several of the lecturers to this very event in the 1990s, and I assure you that it's humbling to be in their company. The late and very generous Matilda Rovelstadt, the brilliant Henriette Avram, and the politically gifted Eileen Cook, among others. So thank you, Dr. Shea, and your alumni board for asking me to come, although I'm still awed by the list of speakers that I join. The centennial year of your school is a century of knowledge, service, and discovery. I hope for the Library and Information Science program that I can interject one additional term, and that term is passion what can be defined as a love and boundless enthusiasm for knowledge, service, and discovery. I believe that those who have gone before made this school's program excellent because they were passionate about their activities. Indeed, in their talks at the Elizabeth Stone Lecture, the women that I mentioned spoke of their passion. Some of you may recall vividly Professor Rovelstadt's dramatic talk on monastic libraries of the Baroque. In another year, the more reflective but equally compelling story in which Ms. Avram described her role in the development of the Mark record. I believe that it's that passion for knowledge, service, and discovery that drives us to do the things that we do. And that is what I want to talk with you about tonight. How passion has defined my career of over 40 years, and I hope how it might impact how you think about the things that we do as librarians and as educators. As you heard, I've been a librarian, I've been in other information-related capacities, and I've been an LIS educator. I hope to accomplish only one thing on the back of that experience tonight, and that is to get us all to think, to really think about what we are doing so that we assure a secure future for our institution and the professions for which we are or ought to be passionate. Now, in order to make my point, I want to tell you some stories. Being a Southerner, as Ingrid mentioned, uh, I believe that we are richer for stories, even around professional issues. If you are not from the Deep South, and I trust that most of you aren't, I'm begging your indulgence in this anyway. So we'll begin in around 1951, when a small preschool girl growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, was under the care of an aunt during the extended illness of her mother and the absence of her father, who traveled for business. 
The aunt was the extension librarian at the Atlanta Public Library. Now, some of you are aware that extension then was something akin to outreach or bookmobile librarianship today. And Atlanta then was a relatively small metropolitan area of about 900,000 people. Two thirds of the people didn't live in the city, but in rural crossroads and small communities throughout Fulton County, Georgia. The girl's aunt, not having childcare readily available in those days, took the girl on the bookmobile every day during the summer. Now this little girl had had a relatively sheltered life in the city, but she wasn't unobservant. This aunt, who not only selected the books from the dim basement of the library each day, loaded them up on the big bookmobile and drove the bookmobile out into the country, had a very different demeanor than anything this girl had observed at home. This was a woman on a mission, driving up onto dirt yards in front of shotgun shacks, slamming on the brakes and then opening the big bus for service. Business started with an announcement to the inhabitants of the modest homes, come on y'all, come out here and get some new books and bring back the ones you had last week so somebody else can read them. <laughs> Scruffy little children with runny noses flocked around with books in hand and the mothers of these children who looked older than their years came out to see the library lady on her weekly visits uh, to their homes. It was clear that this librarian was special to the people that she saw each week. Between stops at the houses and the long ride back to town, the little girl learned about children who don't have nice things like you do, but who can read and learn and one day have pretty clothes and a nice house like you do. And she learned about children who don't have summer shoes and shirts except for church. The aunt taught the little girl that hope could be found between the pages of a children's picture book. The girl's aunt continued to be an extension librarian for another 20 years. She moved from the city to a more rural area where she continued to run bookmobile services for a rural library system. She loved extension work despite the fact that she was invited to be the director. But she did that extension work until the 1970s and her subsequent death. This niece learned a lot from her aunt, a public librarian who was passionate about her work. Fast forward 10 years and a ninth grader is in the suburbs of Baltimore. This student is told by the honors high school teacher, get a card at the Pratt if you intend to pass my course. If you can't afford a card, because you had to pay for them in those days. See me after school. Don't plan to pass my course, he said, using the school library or that pitiful Baltimore County Library. <laughs> and I know there are people from Baltimore County here. That was back in the day. The student got the $5 card at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Pratt was a premier library in its day, as most of you know. Founded in the 1880s, it was one of the grand libraries of the mid 20th century. A city block square with a great hall with brass doors, the H.L. Mencken room, the Edgar Allan Poe room, plus one of the nation's finest collections of young adult materials. The student rode the bus and then transferred to the number eight streetcar, this is in downtown Baltimore in the day, with history classmates every Saturday to research topics and to explore this great library. The wonders of the Pratt with its severe but helpful librarians, the different rooms with different subject collections, and the size of it all were astonishing. The student continued to go there long after the honors history class was over. The history teacher, if he'd thought of it, was the essence of a public library advocate. He influenced a band, a ragtag band at that of high school freshmen to appreciate and to expect excellent library services for the rest of their lives. This went on until this student finished high school 
and went on to college, receiving an English degree and becoming an editor for an engineering company. She hung out in the library so frequently that a librarian said, listen, you should be a librarian. You're hanging out here all the time anyway. This new graduate headed out again for school, library school, because her friend made librarianship, librarianship look important and serious and even fun. This graduate stayed in touch with that woman she believed to be a librarian for many years. The woman, though she lacked the very graduate degree that she promoted, was passionate about libraries nonetheless. In the height of the 60s, and the times really were changing, this young woman enrolled at Emory University. An historically important program, the Division of Librarianship closed its doors in the 1980s decade of library school closures. But what an experience could be had there. The Atlanta Public Library had a branch in the neighborhood of Martin Luther King Sr.'s Ebenezer, Ebenezer Baptist Church. It was the so-called South Branch of the Atlanta Public Library. It couldn't be, or maybe it just wasn't, staffed the way it should have been because of budget constraints or priorities of the library in the day. So students from the library schools at Emory and historically black Clark Atlanta University were given minimum supervision and allowed to maintain Saturday hours in the south end of town. There the young woman worked with a child whose mother wouldn't sign for a library card because the last signature she put on an official document resulted in her mother's furniture being repossessed. She met children who were more interested in her smooth hair than the story hours and read-to programs that were offered there. She went to visit the home of a child and saw for the first time in her life a home with no printed matter whatsoever, not a book, not a newspaper, nor a magazine. Even to this 19-year-old student who was tutoring that child, it was no surprise that a child from that home before even being passed to the seventh grade was four full years behind in reading. In 1968, on the weekend following the Martin Luther King slayings in Memphis, this library school student was told first by her dean, if you want to be a missionary, you have to go where it's hot. Go downtown and open that library. Only to be called later, by the Dean of Atlanta University's program to be told, don't show your white hide on that side of town this weekend. Don't open on Saturday. The library remained closed that weekend and the interns worried about the children who really counted on Saturdays at the South Branch. They worried about this more than the funeral that came to town and the threats of shoot to kill that were made to discourage riots and looting in the city. The deans of the two library schools taught our student that the sometimes conflicting viewpoints make a difference in the viewpoint of library stakeholders. Our student learned that sometimes there was no right answer and that the practice of librarianship was not devoid of tensions and stressors for decision makers. Still in library school, the woman learned public librarianship from an adjunct who witnessed the removal of chairs from a Tennessee public library so that African Americans could be served. The logic, and get this, was that if patrons couldn't sit down, the doors of the library could remain open since folks wouldn't be mixing the races under those circumstances. The amenities were less important to that librarian than providing access to information for everybody in that community. 
Our student graduated and became a public and later a state library staff member and learned from another passionate librarian, a state librarian who studied management on the side and planning, taking courses from the AMA and universities so that she could run an excellent state agency that would secure for all citizens of the state good services, regardless of whether the county of residence was rich or poor, urban or rural, or whether the local tax share was big or small. Our student learned also from a medical librarian, Winifred Sewell, who insisted on inserting herself in research teams at Duke and UNC, and who was later instrumental in the development of important advances in retrieval at the National Library of Medicine. This was a courageous, medical librarian who went on to publish guides to pharmaceutical information and to teach and mentor a generation of medical librarians well into her 80s. Working in the research department at a major, major database publisher, our librarian came to know and respect a man who with a, a chemistry degree, a master's degree from Columbia's library school and loans from household finance company risked personal and professional security to develop and produce tools, most notably current contents, science citation index, and now web of science, so that scientists could access the information they need in a faster and more efficient manner. Now, as you've undoubtedly figured out after my introduction, uh, it was these folks, my Aunt Julia Duggan, my ninth grade teacher, Mr. Reefner, nobody ever knew his first name, <laughs> the public librarian in Baltimore, Mrs. McFadden, the children in Atlanta's ghetto neighborhood, James and Minnie, two library school deans, the late Venable Lawson and the late Virginia Lacey Jones, and outstanding and courageous librarians like Carlton Rochelle, Nettie Taylor, Wynn Sewell, Jean Garfield, who gave back by teaching and mentoring. All these people made the believer that I am today and collectively brought me here to talk with you. So these are stories, and they're just stories. But what do they say about the love and enthusiasm we need to move librarians, libraries and librarianship to a, a vibrant future? Excuse me. How can the passion that led us into library and information studies be renewed at a time when many of us have become older and jaded about our careers? When libraries are suffering from budget cuts, proration, rescission, from neglect, and worst of all, from ignorance of those who say that we don't need libraries anymore when everything is available on the web. I submit to you that the first thing we should do is remember the passionate and courageous people who influenced each and every one of us into our careers. And second, that we try to model their behaviors so that someone remembers the message in our actions. After all the promotions, publications, awards, Leah, and honors, after all, all we have to leave behind is the influence on the next generation. I suggest that we may find a way to renew enthusiasm and passion if we can answer the question of what is the concept of library about and how has it kept people interested for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's one of our oldest institutions after the church, after all. My colleague Charles Osborne, in his 2009 book, The Social Transcript, Uncovering Library Philosophy, notes that the definition of library is much less complex than the concept of library, and that concept is of greater value to a discussion of the library's function than its definition. He further suggests that library is a cultural function that pertains to the stewardship of the recorded social transcript and therefore is a cultural technology that transcends location and method and I questioned him about it and also 
He adds the form of delivery of the service. It can be in a beautiful reading room or on your cellular telephone. The concept is the same. Of course, I concur with him and think that we should consider this general idea of a library rather than trying to define it as an institution, a building, a service, a single function, or a resource. And I would argue for that. But if we focus on the general idea or the concept that is derived from specific instances, we immediately get into the thorny question of what we can see and what we can't see. A concept can't be observed, and so we construct definitions to operationalize the concept. Happily, though, as Powell and Conaway point out in their book on research methods, more than one working definition for a concept is generally considered to be desirable, if not necessary. So I suggest then that we think of library as concept, first and foremost, a concept that involves management and leadership, resources, people, and even the institutional image, and that we recognize that this particular concept is one that is fraught with tensions and conflict and uneasiness. It is this ever-moving and ever-changing tension and conflict that make the concept of library and all the imaginable working definitions so exciting and so evocative of interest and even passion. Anybody see the movie Goodfellas? Oh, come on, you can admit it. A great mafia movie. Think of the scene in that mafia movie when the young gangster, Henry Hill, hands his girlfriend, Karen, a gun. She says that although her friends would be offended by a man who asked them to hide a gun, she found it attractive and exciting. Perhaps we librarians should relate to Karen. Be passionate risk takers who are turned on at the prospect of navigating the tensions and conflicts of the information business. Jesse Shira, the library philosopher, talked about the somewhat bipolar nature of the profession of librarianship. He says we have to balance the knowledge needs of individuals and the knowledge needs of society as a whole. The tension between the two masters that we serve is introduced in every introductory course in library and information studies. We talk about policy, information policy, in terms of keeping all the plates spinning, providing broad access to information while protecting privacy rights, respecting intellectual property while inviting copyright infringement every day by offering printing services and copying services and downloadable uh, technologies to provide downloadable information that probably shouldn't be downloaded. We are in the business of protecting the security of society while in the name of access making information available that is sometimes quite questionable in everything from authority to quality to just plain good taste. There's even a tension between allowing the disheveled homeless a place to sit in an urban library and on the other hand throwing them out so their presence won't dissuade users who have been described as somehow more legitimate. What we don't know when we enter this field is revealed gradually through our graduate school days or perhaps we glimpse a side of it as paraprofessionals or while we're in graduate school. Reality, though, for most of us sets in the first time we confront a big decision as a working information professional. And here is the place where I call upon you to get up the courage and the passion for the library concept. Do we love it enough to make a hard decision? Do we care enough to do the right thing even if it's difficult? Do we regard the library concept with greater respect than we do a single definition of an institution or even worse, a single employer? I hope that we do. Of course, we have our code of ethics that addresses some of the tensions I've mentioned. 
Others that I didn't mention included not advancing our private interests, financial or otherwise, at the expense of a library, and so on and so forth. And these are good things that we should consider and discuss and review again and again against whatever personal concept we have of library. We might interpret the points in the code differently based on our personal concept, but at the end of the day, I bet that regardless of what we consider a library to be, we would believe that we should provide equitable and unbiased service to everyone who would use a library, digital or an in-place physical library. Without arguing about what constitutes library or what constitutes use, I'll just ask these couple of questions. Are we providing unbiased and equitable service to everyone who would use a library? If we ask the homeless person who uses the urban library for a place to rest, to find warmth, to doze in relative safety and security, to move along so that a legitimate scholar can find a seat in a reading room? Ooh. Seattle. Did the public library, the one that allowed this novice library school student to work unsupervised in the ghetto so as to keep a branch open in the south end of town, provide equitable and unbiased service? Here is that tension again between providing equitable and unbiased service to everyone and providing uh, this to the whole of society. In the big picture, I submit that a great job was done of answering to user, individual users' needs in that South Branch Library, but a genuinely lousy job was done at serving society as a whole and even the city at that time. The examples I've given uh, relate primarily to public libraries, but the same tensions exist in all types. In the academic library, are we always honest about what constitutes fair use of copyrighted material, or do we hedge a bit and maybe not do everything we can to maintain the balance between users' rights and creators' rights? In the school media center, are we biased in the ways we serve gifted students or special students. As the young people say all the time, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that these individual decisions and others deserve continual critical examination every day that we go to work. Now I want to say something about how we can go about raising a generation of information professionals for the 21st century who both have a firm concept of library and who understand the tensions and conflicts in it. How do LIS educators, now I'm talking to the faculty and staff, how do we prepare graduates who have the courage to meet the challenges inherent in a profession that by its nature insists that hard decisions be made? Since you are here celebrating 100 years of library education, it's appropriate that I address this for a couple minutes. May I? Okay. The views expressed here, I must say, are my own, derived from a good many years of observation, an interest in the topic, and my personal concept of libraries and library education. I believe that there are three ingredients necessary to prepare the graduates we want. These are first, we must allow for and encourage diverse MLIS programs that can support many, many concepts of library. Second, we should consider recruiting, admitting, and retaining only those students who are passionate about the prospect of professional employment in an information-rich environment like a library, an information center, or a vendor's business associated with information. We also want to recruit and retain those students who have courage to make hard choices that are required in this profession. And we ought to be expecting, in fact demanding, a great deal more of our students, our interns, and our student assistants, GTAs, and research assistants by giving them chances to make decisions and to make, dare I say, horrible mistakes while they are with us and where they can learn. 
Let's look at each of these ingredients briefly. First, regarding diverse programs, I should say that I came along at a time when many of our library schools were private, like Catholic University of America. At, in my day, as I would say, Columbia reigned supreme, Chicago, Vanderbilt, Case Western Reserve, Denver the first, uh, USC as in California, Atlanta University as well as Emory graduated a good proportion of the people who entered the profession. Catholic, Dominican, now that used to be Rosary College, Drexel, Simmons, and Pratt, as well as a few others, survived the shift away from private to public education of librarians and information professionals. In fairness, I must mention that I did earn the PhD at Drexel, and so my educational experience was in private institutions. The LIS education landscape had been forever altered when a host of public universities brought on full master's degree programs in the late 1960s and early 70s. Just so you have the same perspective here, be aware that in the 10 years between 1965 and 1975, 17 of the 62 currently accredited programs were accredited for the first time. That means that over 30% of the existing schools have yet to celebrate their 40th anniversaries of their founding. See, Catholics done a great job. You survived all these years. All but two of the post-1965 programs uh, reside in public institutions. So all of those new schools at that time were public. Meanwhile, in the next decade, 10 programs closed down. All but two of them were in private universities. So we have to understand that the private universities have typically kept their library schools freestanding while the publics have typically in now inserted their programs into um, larger colleges. At this point, the freestanding autonomous private institutions are Catholic, Dominican, Drexel, Simmons, Syracuse, and Pratt, and I don't, maybe there are a couple of others, but I can't think of them. At the same time, a good proportion of the programs resident in public universities have been, been put into colleges and larger units. Listen to the list. Rutgers, Kentucky, Greensboro, South Carolina, Alabama, Buffalo, Arizona, Tennessee, Hawaii, Oklahoma, even UCLA are subunits of larger colleges. Notably, North Texas and FSU have joined the club as well, and even the University of Illinois, forever ranked number one, has had to defend its independent freestanding status. We find LS, LIS programs then that are freestanding like CUA, or we have many that are in various colleges, everything from education to communications to um, even some programs that report to the Dean of Libraries. To say that, I could give you a catalog of reasons that it's great to be in another college. Things like diversity of research methods, diversity of research outputs, access to resources, and so on and so forth. But I won't go through the full list. Probably the best reason is that in a college structure, students can benefit from broader curricular offerings. In our particular college, our students can take courses in journalism, in public relations, in uh, telecommunication and film, in rhetoric, in uh, organizational communications and the like. Now, that's interesting only if you're on campus uh, and it's interesting only if you can get in those courses, but nonetheless, they are there for the student who would like to have them. Maybe in the freestanding institutions, students can just go over to another department and take a course. The research benefits for the faculty are great because we have more colleagues with which to interact and with which to collaborate. And the disadvantage, of course, is being slightly further away from direct access to the provost and to the resources. 
My belief that this is only a disadvantage when there is a lack of trust between the unit head, that would be a director or a department head, and the dean, who does have direct access to the provost. Such lacks of trust can lead, lead to omissions of communication and the withholding of resources to other than the dean's pet projects or subunits. For myself, and in case you haven't figured it out, I've been called pushy more than once. I believe that in this field, we only need to select and appoint only, only, only pushy, pushy, pushy deans and directors who have the courage to develop the relationships among superiors for the benefit of our programs. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean to argue that we need all of our programs to be in other larger units. I think what we have to have is um, diversity in our programs. And when we allow accrediting agencies, and my program is accredited by four different accrediting agencies, when we allow them to dictate that we should have a cookie cutter situation in our programs, we need to uh, get courageous and say no. That won't do. This is a field where there are many concepts of libraries and we have to address that. We can incorporate both digital and physical collections in what we teach. We can talk about in-place and remote services for libraries. We need to be as diverse in our schools, in our programs that are educating librarians as we are about what constitutes a library. This means variety in curricula, in organizational structure, in what kind of distance education we want to have, synchronous, asynchronous, whether we want to do face-to-face, -face, and we need to entertain a wide, wide variety of academic foci. So if you think of a library as a concept with room for many operational definitions, you'll have to agree with me that we do need the diversity to encourage universities and accreditation agencies to let us celebrate that diversity and not give us the cookie cutter programs to aspire to. We have to be courageous and energetic enough to work hard to assure that we retain these opportunities for our own profession. Having programs in Catholic institutions of different sorts is a good thing like here at CUA or at Dominican or St. John's or now St. Catharines in Minnesota. This makes the, the list of schools richer for the diversity. A student whose concept of library has to do with social justice might go to St. Catharines. Another whose interests line up with the Vincentian order might enroll at St. John's. While a student whose concept relates to canon law or Catholic archives could come here to study. The big concept is richer for the diversity of the programs. We have to support them, and we must not let our programs become interchangeable. I was going to, but I think I will not take on the iSchool debate. There is room, however, for both. The, the information-rich schools may find themselves subject, I'll just say, to some of the same uh, pressures that the library schools have seen. One of the big arguments for the iSchool movement was funding for research. We were going to get on the porch and run with the big dogs so that we would have huge amounts of funding from the federal agencies in the so-called iSchools. Let me tell you that last year there were three or in 2009, I guess, a year old statistics, there were three schools that had $4 million in funding. Compare that to what happens in engineering, in business, in other programs in the sciences, and we look like peanuts. Okay, so I see those programs becoming part of larger units too. I don't think they can sustain themselves unless they have enormous enrollments. 
and I'm not sure how you all feel about it here at Catholic, but in my day here, we prided ourselves on having a reasonable, sensible enrollment where people knew one another, where there was some camaraderie across the student body, and where we didn't have 2,000 students uh, trying to get the same thing done with a relatively small faculty. But that's neither here nor there. There's room for the I schools, the L schools, the traditional ones, and the more modern ones, if you will. There's room for other things in our school, including book arts, as we have at Alabama, and preservation, conservation, archival programs that we see other places. We want to serve all the library contexts and all of the library concepts. Now the last, next to the last thing we should do is to worry about who we admit. Most of our programs admit applicants with a minimum GRE score of 1,000 to 1,200 and an undergraduate GPA of 3.0 or better on a four-point scale. Some schools require interviews, written recommendations, statements of purpose, essays, writing samples, and so on. But the measurable criteria are always the scores. I suggest that we all think more holistically, not in order to admit more, less qualified students to fill our rosters, but to raise the bar so that the scores mean relatively little and the essay or the interview means a great deal. Keep the minimum test scores. We need to be sure that everybody's kind of literate and kind of numerate. But the deciding factor should be what the applicants say about themselves, what they want to do, what they're passionate about, and why. I recommend that we take the ones whose essays suggest that they are adventuresome, courageous, curious, and willing to work hard. I say take the student with the low GPA and the minimum score on the GRE who has hiked the Appalachian Trail alone, who has worked in a European book bindery, who is changing careers because of a passion for libraries. Don't take the 4.0 applicant with the 1500 score who has grown tired of middle school teaching and would like to be a media specialist so that she can provide, get a little rest, while staying in the system to get a great big fat retirement check at the end. Forget about the Yaley who says he's been stressed by his excellent business career and wants to relax a little. Let's deny admission to the applicants whose references tell us they are painfully reserved but great at working alone, socially awkward but brilliant, or like one I received recently that said, this student will make a perfect librarian because he cannot be distracted from detailed tasks like shelving books, inputting data on the computer, and transcribing tapes from boring meetings verbatim. The letter went on to describe why the student wouldn't make a good lawyer, doctor, or businessman, but he would be perfect for librarianship. I also advise our LIS admissions committee to be wary of the 40-year-old applicant with no work experience, four or five different graduate degrees, who needs a full ride. I ask our admission committee to consider whether the applicants are likely to work in the profession and make contributions to it. Sometimes we admit such applicants but we don't offer them financial support, simply to test their motivation in their first semester. The percentage of them who actually enroll is somewhere just above zero. We learn that the same individuals have stayed on campus, taken up space, taking up faculty time and attention in other programs, sometimes several of them at a time. But we're glad we're not working with them. They may be brilliant, but it doesn't look promising in the contribution department. Now, some schools are, to be sure, under pressure to grow in enrollment. And all statistics appear to tell us that library and information science um, enrollments are up, according to statistics. 
But we need to grow our enrollments through other means than taking everyone who comes along. Students who are smart, who are confident, who are courageous, who are savvy, these are the ones we want because they are the ones who will care enough to tell us old guys when our teaching is a bit off, when our classes are not what they should be, when they feel we're not providing what they need to make it in the marketplace for work, and even when their peers are not stepping up in group projects or holding back progress in a class. They may seem to be high maintenance now, these students, and I know the faculty know the kind I'm talking about. Um, they may look like high maintenance now, but these are the ones who will succeed professionally, who will stay in the field, who will take leadership positions and give back by recruiting and recommending good students and by supporting our institutional development and alumni giving campaigns. Finally, the campus administrations should reward us if we recruit good students who finish and go on to do great things. Our programs aren't long. Most programs are no more than 42 to 46 hours. We want to be sure that students come to us with some desirable characteristics since we can't do a personality makeover in 36 or 42 hours. We want to get the most excellent students and unlike Lady Liberty, we don't want the tired, the poor, or even the huddled masses unless they rest up and get ready for a rigorous education and challenging career. Finally, we want to provide our students with programs that challenge our students technologically, philosophically, socially, and intellectually. More than learning how to, students learn, need to learn how they should think about the library concept and how to keep growing and developing it. Again, Ingrid, your theme, knowledge, service, and discovery, says exactly what we need to expose to our students. The ones who really get it should have to work hard to get it, and they should take pride in achieving much. They need to learn the how-tos, no doubt about it, but I believe along with the theories and the practices of library functions, we have to do a much better job of inculcating professional values, ethical behavior, entrepreneurial thinking, and collaborative approaches to research that can solve practical and theoretical problems in every class that we offer. If we don't, Instead of leaders, our graduates will be worker bees, and instead of developing real professional lives, they will settle to take a job. Instead of leading the way, they will wring their hands and bemoan every budget cut, every neglectful slight from funders and parent organizations, and they will waffle every time they are asked to make a decision. Let's make library school hard, not easy, and raise the bar for both entry and exit. That way, the next generation will be able to handle the challenge. When Monsignor John F. Whipple, then provost of this university, interviewed me for my first dean job in 1994, he asked me why I had become a librarian. My answer was because librarians provide information that can change people's lives for the better, and I'm passionate about doing that. Now, after 17 years and two additional leadership positions, I'm even more convinced that we do make a difference and that we have the wherewithal to pass our passion for this endeavor on to the next generation for our profession. It's all of our jobs, teachers, leaders, deans, directors, and students, because you will graduate and you will attract, I hope, a next generation that can do the job. To do anything less would be neglectful. We are all fortunate, everyone here is fortunate to be in a field that allows for multiple interpretations of the library concept and that provides a broad spectrum of opportunity for each and every one of us. My wish for you, my colleagues in practice and in the academy, is that we find our passion, find it now and use it along with amazing courage, decisiveness, and intellect to advance knowledge, service, and discovery. I'm grateful for your attention, and I hope, if nothing else, that I might have inspired you to think about what you're doing with a little bit more love and a little bit more enthusiasm. Thanks for letting me share my thoughts with you.